The theory was that Troy never existed other than in the mind of Homer. And as Homer wrote a fictitious poem about Troy, Troy was a fictitious place. It had no foundation in fact or truth and was non-existent. Therefore, a history which based itself upon the first king of Britain being Brutus, the great grandson of Anchises and grandson of Aeneas of Troy, and that the whole of the British nation were originally, or a large part of them were originally Trojan, had to be a false history. As it was a false history based on Homer's fictional epic, therefore you throw out British history. And this actually was done. And you will find books by these supposed scholars from Oxford and elsewhere stating this temple because it's known that Solomon put plates of gold on the temple walls. Yes. Pharaoh Shishak, Shishak, about 935, took them away. His son Rehoboam couldn't afford gold plates, yeah. so he put up... Yes. No, um, so, what we do, we trace the alphabet from yes. there to where they were deported, the ten tribes were deported. The ten tribes of Israel are taken away from uh, Jerusalem, right? Solomon's temple's there. Yes. King Ahaziah of Judea, two tribes, he's had a successful battle with the Edomites and he's going to attack ten tribe Israel. And he's warned, there's a famous verse in the Bible about a passing bullock ste stepping on a, a thistle. He's the thistle, you see. Don't do it. Well, he got hammered. His army is destroyed. He's tied behind the chariot of Jehoash, the Israelite king, goes to Jerusalem, pulls down 200 yards of the wall, and Jehoash then takes everything from the palace, and he takes everything from the temple. Oh, including the scrolls, then? Including the ark. Oh, the ark. Aha, uh because -huh. oh. you've got to realise it's in Kings and Chronicles in the Bible, and it's in Flavius Josephus. And wasn't there a family that was a looking after the ark right. for generations? The family of Obed-Edom. He took them as well. There'd be no point in taking the family of Obed Edom if he didn't take the ark. So we said, hang on, the ark's gone. So the ark left the temple. It's gone north to Samaria in 790 BC. We know. And you found all the evidence for this, presumably? Yeah. Well, what we did, we tried trying to translate the Etruscan stuff. No. They went north to Samaria. 690, 687, Sennacherib, the Assyrian emperor, is murdered by two of his sons. The heir, the older son, has a civil war with them. The ten tribes take off and they cross the Euphrates, going west through Turkey. Right. Second book of Esdras, chapter 14, right? Okay? Mm -hmm. They are going through Turkey and the Greeks pick up on them and they call these Cymri the Kimaroi. Kimaroi Cymri, right? The Welsh again. They get, well, the Brits. <laughs> the Brits. Yeah, I'm a Brit, you know, we're all Brits, come on. They get to the Dardanelles, half the people stay there and the other half go to Italy. The Dardanelles are in Turkey, aren't they? Yes, on the end of Turkey, where the little gap to go up in the Black Sea. On the Bosphorus. The Bosphorus, yeah. Where the great city is. Yeah. And Plus that named after Constantine. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's the So, anyway, <laughs> by looking at the, Etrus the Etruscan writings, we found we could read them. To our uh, Amelia, the Ten Tribes of Israel. Then they went through Asia Minor, and then. Half of them went to Etruria, Italy. Half went to the Isle of Lemnus and then to the UK. It's all recorded. Yes. See, in one, one stele of Sennacherib, it says in one of his deportations, he removed 200,120 people. So these are not small groups. That's a huge yeah, they, diaspora. Well, isn't they, it? they went through Asia Minor. The Greeks call them the Kimaroi, the Cymri, see? Yes. And uh, they were like a tidal wave. Nothing could stop them. Half go to Italy, half stay there. Not like locusts, in a sense. Oh, right. Take some stop. So the other half stay there, and then they come to Britain in 500. Now, we're still translating. We've moved from Italy. We're in the Aegean now. On the island of Lemnos, a stele was found in 18, 1876, and it's plastered with cauldron writing. And there's a guy holding a spear, a big guy with a spear. And it tells how the people have gathered there, and they're under their On the chosen. island of Lemnos? Yeah. Well, in the, the British records, they say the people gathered on the oil of Ligotia, which is Lemnos. Is but surely it? that's further east than Italy. No, it's south of it. Yes, we've moved. We're going back in time. We're oh, going yeah. back. There they've now got the Dardanelles. 
get them on. Okay. They gather in the records. It says, "Oh, they gathered their fleet at this island." And here's this stele, and it tells how they've been directed by the god, and they're going to sail together to a great green island out in the Western Ocean. That's what it says. So they sailed out of the Straits of Gibraltar through there and <coughs> to the UK. The no, they picked up three or four other groups on en route. One with Carinas, who goes to Cornwall, and uh, so on. So here is a story matching the British record of a gathering on an island to sail to the UK. And it's, it's the secret is this language and alphabet, perfectly preserved. The alphabet appears all along the route. Everything depends on that. And there are inscriptions and stating where the ark was at certain times. Right. And it's obviously in the UK. You believe that um, ancient British history has been distorted over the last sort of 100 to 200 years and that, mm -hmm. that basically the Roman occupation was far less than, than is stated in normal history books. Now, we need to go back, I think, to 700 BC with the ten tribes of Israel. Uh, can you tell us about uh, um, those, Alan? And, and um, the second migration into Britain is that one you're referring to. Mm -hmm. uh, what has happened is that uh, we had uh, an ancient alphabet in Britain. Mm -hmm. Julius Caesar describes it, numerous others. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. David Ap Gwilym died 1367, describes it. It's on ancient storms of 600, 500 BC, AD. Mm -hmm in Scotland, in England, and in Wales. Um, it's described by a number of uh, writers in Wales in the 1425, 1450, 1470 period. Uh, Rhys Gork of Oswestry wrote a whole poem about it in mm -hmm. 13, 1582. This is the, and so it's pronounced the alphabet, alphabet, yeah. So the, the dispute has been that uh, in recent times, and I mean recent times, 1930s onwards, Mm -hmm. The Colburn alphabet was declared to be a forgery of 1800. Mm -hmm. Well, Julius Caesar would have had a job to, job to describe it, and all these others would have had a job to describe it, and it wouldn't be on ancient stones. Okay. It's on one stone in Wales which says Godufan the exile, mm -hmm. and Godufan was a king who was deposed around the year 8200, mm -hmm. and so on. So the authenticity of this alphabet is, is literally beyond dispute. Okay, so you've compared this alphabet with um, yeah. another alphabet from basically from the east from well no what, what's happened is in uh, 1797 a writer mm -hmm. in uh, 1848 another book was published 1852 another book was published 1848 john williams from oxford and in 1960 delta evans and they all said isn't it strange the ancient british alphabet is virtually identical with ancient etruscan italy right? mm -hmm. and pelasgian which means the aegean and asia minor Okay. So that matches the migration route of the ancient British people. Mm -hmm. So like the Brits have gone to Australia, New Zealand, Canada, America, they've taken their religion, their customs, their language, and their alphabet and everything with them. Mm -hmm. So other people migrating would do the same. Mm -hmm. Now, Llewellyn Sean, uh, around 1530 to 1560, preserved the cipher of the alphabet. So we know which symbol is A, which is B, which is C, and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. We thought, well, it's been said that every alphabet known to mankind has been tried to translate Etruscan. Well, that's not true, because they didn't try British alphabet, and they didn't try the Welsh language. Okay. So we did that. We tried it out. Okay, and one of the um, artefacts is the, um, the Buddha stone from yeah. Lemnos, yeah. which contains some of this ancient alphabet, which yeah. you have compared with the ancient British alphabet mm -hmm. and found, you know, Identity. basically that it's, it's based on the same, on the same thing. And in 504 BC, the migration of some of the tribes of Israel came to the, to yeah. Britain. Basically. Yeah. What, what has happened is that the Assyrians knew uh, the ten tribes of Israel as the Khumri, K H U M R Y. Mm -hmm. Uh, they had been deported from Israel up north into the Armenia area around there. Mm -hmm. When Sennacherib was murdered, uh, 687 BC, they took that opportunity with a civil war raging in Assyria and they moved through Turkey, mm -hmm. coming west. And the Greeks picked up and they called the Cymru the Kimeroi. 
Well, they yeah. would. And the Cimmerians. So he got to the Dardanelles about 650 BC. Well, there are inscriptions in this same alphabet right the way through Turkey. Okay. Um, equally, um, Austin Layard discovered the archives of the Assyrian emperors, mm -hmm. sent 25,000 clay tablets to London, mm -hmm. and some of the people at the British Museum said, oh gosh, look, <laughs> here's the ancient British alphabet mm -hmm. on some of the big clay tablets mm -hmm. from the records of the Assyrians. So it occurred to us that the Cymri, the Kimmeroi, are the same people. Because mm -hmm. again, it's on the migration trail. And this sort of, um, you, you believe that there were no Celts in Britain up until about 1714 then, is that? When they were invented. Right, when the Celts were invented. <laughs> That's right. Okay. If, the, if the British people are Celtic, then right. all the histories are wrong okay. and can be rejected. Right. The same applies to Ireland. And the idea of them being, see, if you dispossess people of their history mm -hmm. and you eliminate the history, which has been done, Mm -hmm. then you have to give them a new identity. Yes. So why not Celts? Okay. Yeah. And um, you believe that, that there were um, basically British kings right the way through the Roman era? Oh, you can prove in, that. In, in you Britain. can prove that, yeah. Okay. The kings started with Brutus around 500 BC, mm -hmm. and there are 80 successive Welsh kings right. based mainly in South, in South Wales. Right. And Arthur one and two yeah. were two of those kings? Yeah, they were two of those kings, yeah. Okay. Okay, Alan, well, we're going to go for a short break now. It's all fascinating stuff. So join us soon after this short break. You know, in your books, you've described how they, they, they came to Britain from Lemnos. Now, is there any evidence from before this time of yeah. the ten tribes of, of, of Israel? Yeah. Well, around 8, 1948, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, well not everybody. The Dead Sea Scrolls are generally on, uh, I think, papyrus or that type of writing material and they're in Aramaic, the Aramaic alphabet. But they also found two copper scrolls, and the copper scrolls are inscribed not in Aramaic, and not in the Aramaic alphabet language. Okay. Now, it, Jim Michael of Kentucky, <laughs> researching there, came to exactly the same conclusion as we did in 1994, uh, that it's the Colburn alphabet. Again, right. Okay. And so you've got the Colburn alphabet in Kentucky, in, in, found by Michael in Kentucky. I went out to see him, went to a Baptist seminary there, had a look at good pictures, and it's the Colburn alphabet. What has happened is that if you look at them, these copper scrolls, they uh, have been sliced up to get them unrolled, mm -hmm. but there are holes all along the top and holes all along the bottom. So once upon a time, they were flat plates nailed to a wall, and someone must have ripped them from the wall because there are tear marks from the holes, top and bottom. Roll them up and put them in this clay jar or whatever. Yeah. Because otherwise you wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Now, we think, therefore, it's been ripped off a temple wall or something. But they do read into the Welsh language. So it's the same as Etruscan. You take the Etruscan or the other symbol. Uh, you put the modern letter underneath, because we've got the cipher, thanks to the wedding shot and they look up a Welsh dictionary and you got the word and you can read the Copper Scrolls. So you're right back there. Uh, further back, uh, a large wrapping sheet that they call it the, the Shroud is now in, um, it's in Yugoslavia. Right. And this Shroud, the Zagreb Shroud, about 30 feet long, 30 inches wide, is inscribed totally with the same Colburn alphabet. Okay. So it goes right back into Egypt. Right. Fascinating. Okay, now, another one of your books, Alan, is the discovery of the Ark of the Covenant. And, mm. you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. Because yeah. you've um, uncovered various pieces of evidence mm. which basically chart the path of mm. the Ark of the Covenant from, you know, the, the Middle East over to Britain, mm. basically. Can mm. you explain what evidence you have and what, yeah. what makes you believe that it's in Britain? Well, uh, when we were doing the Etruscan stuff, we did uh, little cups and vases with little words and little phrases on and all sorts of artifacts. And then we moved up to sentences written where there's say, a statue and a bit of writing on it. Uh, in the, the Etruscan tombs, there are frescoes on the walls and a little bit of writing here and there. And then we moved up to the big, uh, they call them Cephas, it's a C I P P U S, Keepus. And they're great big slabs with inscriptions. And we, we went along further and we found things. 
There's one big uh, bronze tablet, which would be enormously expensive bronze, you know, and it's got uh, three sections of writing on it. And in it, it tells how the people are in a place where they're not happy, and there are great storms and pestilences, so they leave and they follow a little cabinet riding in a cart. Mm -hmm. And they come to a place where they are happy. I'm paraphrasing it. Obviously. Yeah, yeah. Then the second time, they are taken away from where they're happy to a place where, again, they're unhappy. And again, they follow the little cabinet that rides in the cart. Uh, you see what? And they are now in a place where they don't want to be. And then the third section tells how they take off. This is the phrase, they take off again, right? And they go away from this place where they're unhappy, and they follow the little cabinet in a cart until they come to a seashore, and they take ships and go where they are now. Well, we take that, because there is a migration of this sort from Asia Minor, regarded by Herodotus, going to Italy. You see? Okay. Bas a big migration. And we take that as the first the journey from Egypt to Israel. Second, the deportation between 740 and 702 by the four to five successive Egyptian emperors, Tiglath, Pileser, Shalman, V, Sargon, Sennacherib, so on. They deported hundreds of thousands. I mean, one deportation, 200,000 people. Is this the 10 tribes? Took them up north, right. deported them, leaving only the two tribes. Okay. And so that's the second section. And the third section is where they, Sennacherib is murdered by two of his sons, civil war erupts in Assyria, and they take their chance and head off through Asia Minor, through Turkey. And they go to the Dardanelles area, they take ship, and they go to Italy. Half the people go, according to Herodotus. Okay. The other half stay. Now, that would fit again. The little cabinet riding in the cart, we think, is the ark. I don't think it could be anything else. Right. So the no. other half had the, the ark. It either goes to Italy or it comes to the UK. Okay. One of the two. Right. Now, if you live in Cardiff and you've got any interest, in, certainly when I was young, uh, there's a North Cardiff legend. Our story, folks, day, call it what you will. And it says that there's a giant or large wooden cabinet, a box. And the box contains a great treasure. But it's guarded by two Kig Rangoa, giant ravens. Now, it doesn't take a genius to see the Ark of the Covenant containing the stones with Moses' tablets or something, and on the top are the two cherubim with their wings fiercely guarding the ark, you see. So the cherubim won the little angelic figure. They no, no, I've, I've ferocious covered that in a program, beast, actually. Yeah. A ferocious. The highest rank of uh, angels, uh, which were It was ferocious, pretty nasty. Yeah. Didn't want to meet him. So somewhere yeah. north of there, well, in modern times, people were going up on a Sunday with their metal detectors looking for this. Uh -huh. uh, it, it goes right up to Ronda and over to my stag, that, that area. They don't know what it is. About 15 years ago, two brothers from the top of the Ronda out one Sunday with their sandwiches and their metal detectors. They sat down on a mound and one of them forgot to put his metal detector off. And of course it goes ping, 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 and they thought, oh, they'd found it, but they hadn't. Right. They'd found 90,000 pounds worth of Roman coins. Okay. But people were looking for this object. Now we thought, hang about, this is, this is the little box that rides in the cabinet. Because if the people come from Lemnos, under Brutus, and they come here to the UK, then here we are, we've got the Ark in the UK. Right. And this is the zone. Right, okay. So we're in, a, in an area, a zone. Right, okay. Now, you then started looking at ancient mounds, didn't you? Um, uh, yeah, my which, colleague... Which brought, yeah. New, brought new evidence, you know, and mm. basically, eventually guided you to the location. Mm. There are large earth mounds scattered right across parts of Gwent and Glamorgan and up to Brecon, uh, maybe 50 miles that way and, you know, east to west and uh, 30, 35 miles north or so. Okay. There's another great big patch of them down in Pembrokeshire, mm -hmm. these mounds. My colleague said to me, what's the name of that? Because he's a Newcastle man. I'm half Newcastle and half Cardiff, yeah. father and mother. And I said, oh, I bloody it. It means ferocious warrior. Right. And I started thinking, hold it, hold it, hold it, you know. And I said, that's what the ancient Egyptians 
and the ancient Arabs and the Hebrews called the constellation of Hercules. Okay. See? Forget the Romans, forget the, the Greeks, leave them out of it, because they, they're misleading. It, the concentration on them is wrong. Right. So we already knew there was another huge mound over to the east, and that's called Tumbalum. means the he-goat. Right. The billy goat. Well, hang about, the constellation main star Hercules, and then you've got Capricorn, the goat. Right. So we, we knew that we were looking perhaps at the main stars, the first and second magnitude. Right. The, bright, the, the constellations. Stars. Yeah. Up on the hill then, down below, uh, just outside Cardiff, the Garth Mountain, there are three mounds in a row, two big ones and one little one. Now, you, you know the Adrian Gilbert and Beauvale business of the two big pyramids, the little one, the belt of Orion. Yeah. Orion's belt, well, the Giza pyramids, yeah, we all know In that. relation to these others, that was in the right position. Okay. Now, once you know two or three, you can triangulate and you find the pole star. Okay. And we did, we triangulated and there's, we found a, a standing stone. Okay. So we know the pole star. And from there, you could work out all these other mounds. We've got a map here, I'll just unfold it on the desk, um, which basically, you, I mean, you may not be able to see it too well, but you've charted on here, this is the pole star here. Yes. Am I right? Yeah. So where there's a huge standing stone. They're not huge, but it's a standing stone. Okay, it's a standing stone. And there are many other, well, how many how many um, ancient mounds are there marked on this map? I mean, well, we've got 50 or 60 50, located. 50 or 60. Yeah. And, and, and you believe that all of these mounds represent a, a bright star? Yes, well, it, it can't be otherwise. Right. I mean, it's difficult to see it any other way. Okay. You look for well, Taurus must be over there, and they are in the middle of it, and yeah. a state in Cardiff is a yeah. mound, I mean, you know. And and what about so that means that if it was the the people from you know Assyria or the the, the ten tribes that made these mounds, that mm. means they must all be after 500 BC. Is that well? Yeah. That be right. Or well, we don't know. Uh, we don't know. The first migration is from Syria to mm -hmm. Britain mm -hmm. with Albine. Right. Masses of evidence for that dug up by. Uh, the great Leonard Woolley. And what year was Didn't that? Didn't realize it. He was excavating uh, Ur, uh, 1922 to 34. Got overshadowed by Tutankhamun, mm -hmm. but his discoveries were greater. Right. But where, but where, what year did, were the discoveries from, would you say? Well, they thing? would have come into Britain, the Syrians, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's what you get named Surrey. Right. That's why in uh, the mm -hmm. Odyssey, uh, Homer, in the Odyssey, uh, Ulysses says to his farm bailiff, where are you from, actually? I'm in for the great island out in the Western Ocean called Surrey. Right. Surrey, you see? Right, okay. Uh, it, there's a hell of a lot mix. Yeah, but the point is that we now knew that these were star mounds. Right. And we also knew that we had the two migrations pegged down. Because the archaeologists will tell you that the two sudden eruptions in Britain of huge, high-quality metalworking cults, cultures Okay, Alan. Well, and they come out of nowhere. Right. Well, we'll come back to the Ark of the Covenant in, in part. In modern times, it's been regarded as uh, a bogus history. And the reason for it being a bogus history comes out of Oxford and Cambridge and London in England. And the theory was that Troy never existed other than in the mind of Homer. And as Homer wrote a fictitious poem about Troy, Troy was a fictitious place. It had no foundation in fact or truth and was non-existent. Therefore, a history which based itself upon the first king of Britain being Brutus, the great grandson of Anchises and grandson of Aeneas of Troy, and that the whole of the British nation were originally, or a large part of them were originally Trojan, had to be a false history. As it was a false history based on Homer's fictional epic, therefore you throw out British history. And this actually was done. And you will find books by these supposed scholars from Oxford and elsewhere stating this in the words that I've just stated. Look, the, the study of ancient history, uh, it doesn't matter if it's Cuneiform and the ancient Sumerians and so on, or Egypt and the alleged decipherment of hieroglyphics, mm -hmm. or the Hittites, you've got to get the ancient scripts and you've got to be able to decipher them and you have to know the language. Mm -hmm. 
So you have to know the alphabet and the language. Now, this project is all about an alphabet, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. The Kuhlman we, alphabet. We, this alphabet is preserved in Wales. Now, the reason for it, be, it's British. Let's, it, Welsh history is British history. It belongs to all of us. The one part of Britain that wasn't really overrun at some time in the centuries and sometime destroyed by Irish people in North Wales or others flooding in was South East Wales. Okay. Immensely poor. Glamorgan. Glamorgan, Gwent, bits of Brecon and mm. perhaps maybe the Red Cantref, Gloucester to the west of the Severn. A largest place called Esalug. The Romans called Esalug Silures, they called them. It means abounding in prospects. That's where the alphabet and the ciphers were preserved. You've got an alphabet in Britain, right? The Colburn alphabet. And it's tracing the alphabet is the key. I mean, I got a guy writing to me a month ago. He's found more Colburn inscriptions in a cave in Pembrokeshire. And they declared that the ancient alphabet was a complete forgery invented in roughly 1800 AD, 200 years ago, Napoleon's time. And the villain of the piece was a fellow named Edward Williams, who was a great copier of old manuscripts. You see, in Britain, manuscripts rot and they fade and they get wormwood and they get damaged in fires and that, you know. So they kept recopying them down the years. So the Colburn alphabet is taught forgery. Well, that doesn't explain how it's on stones in Scotland, which are comfortably dated to around 500 AD, which is only 1300 years before it's forged. It doesn't explain all the well in Sean wrote down the ciphers of the alphabet in 1530. It doesn't explain why there are stones in England with the Colburn alphabet on it. 1852, 28 feet down, they dug up a stone in St. Paul's Churchyard in London, plastered with it. Can't be right. There are stones in Wales, same alphabet. English uh, people who wrote sort of travel itineraries around Britain, various things. They noted several stones, and in the pre-photograph age, they drew pictures of stones in England, which had the same Colburn alphabet. Which he claimed was forged in 1800, and that it was no earlier. Therefore, any claim of there being an alphabet earlier was spurious. And he targeted one person. Well, that's peculiar because uh, a major Oxford scholar published a whole book on the Colburn alphabet, not this guy, uh, you know, in 1802. And then we find that David Ap Gwilym, who died in 1367, mentions it. Mm -hmm. And then we find that two other poets around 1420 yeah. <laughs> mention it, another two around 1440, 1440 mention it and another couple in the 1470s. Right. Then you get another poet, Rhys Goch of Oswestry. He writes a whole poem about it, lampooning it a bit, mm -hmm. in 1582. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a long time before 1800 forgery. Mm -hmm. And this goes on. Well, we found uh, a person writing in 1897, a publication in 1848 from Oxford, a publication in 1852, yeah, and a publication in 1906 saying, isn't it strange? The Welsh British ancient alphabet is identical, or near identical, to the old Etruscan alphabet and the Pelasgian alphabet of the Aegean and Turkey. It's identical to Etruscan, it's identical to the Pelasgian in Turkey and the Aegean. So we decided the alphabet was genuine. So we took, this, <laughs> we took some of these inscriptions. It was best to sort of work our way backwards slowly. There are stones in Scotland, Wales and England which have this alphabet on them. Okay. So we'd worked on them, they read out. We said, well, that's a G, that's a W, that's an E, you know. And out came Welsh words. And we could read the unreadable inscriptions in Britain. So we took little tiny inscriptions in Etruria in Italy. Now there are 14,000 plus inscriptions in Italy and they can't read them. Pliny, writing around the turn of the Christian era, he wrote, be careful, Etruscan is not related to Latin or Greek. So what do they do? They try and translate the Etruscan as Latin or Greek. Get nowhere. So we took little ones, like on a wine jug, there was an inscription. And they said, drink too much and you're bandy-legged like a sailor. So we've now been happily reading unreadable, indecipherable Etruscan since 1984. We've attempted to tell archaeologists and scholars and linguists they don't even answer your letters. 
You see, we're not working for a university. Thank God. Yeah, well, go and read the ones in Italy now. Okay. Now, we've got an alphabet going back in that way. Now, going, going, we've got an alphabet going east, haven't we? Going east. Well, well coming I from would the think east. it came from the east, okay. right? The tracing of British history and the arc relies on tracing the alphabet. The, the, the passage of things so written in that alphabet. Or British very people similar. went to New Zealand, Australia, they took their language, mm -hmm. their alphabet and their religion with them. Mm -hmm. So if you trace our ancestral histories that were thrown away, mm -hmm. their junk, you know, get rid of them, don't need them, which happened in the, the mid-19th century, because you've got to realise Darwin is around and he's saying, hang around, you know, uh, God didn't just wave the wand and in six days he had all the animals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, these, these are developing over centuries and million, millions of years. Mm -hmm. And then you had earlier there, Lyle, who was saying, these are fossils and fossils done form uh, mm -hmm. in the last couple of thousand years. They're millions of years old and he was into, you know, that. And uh, the church was rocking like a boat because, oh my God, mm -hmm. uh, it's supposed to be happening in 4004. BC, you see, right. and here into this mix comes this business of the alphabet. The alphabet takes us back right across through Europe, you see, and so uh, the journey starts actually in Egypt. The, the alphabet is on, on shrouds of mummies, right? When Austin Layard dug up the archives of the Assyrian emperors at Nineveh, mm -hmm. and he did this in 1846, the first find was uh, 25,000 clay baked tablets, all their writings and archives and dealings. Yes. Packed them all up, sent them to the London British Museum. I've seen them, I think. Uh, later, his Arab, uh, an Arab general, I think his name was Hormuz, but he found another 5,000. When these tablets got to the British Museum, they were looking at them and so they suddenly, <laughs> wow, some of these have got the ancient British alphabet. <laughs> No, there's a coincidence. There's a coincidence. What are the chances but, of that? Well, wait a minute. You see, you've got the alphabet right through Turkey. The Assyrians now have it in correspondence probably sent to them. So we reason this. If the alphabet stretches back in that direction, how much further does it go? This starts you thinking because the name of the ten tribes of Israel, as recorded by the Assyrians, was the Qumri. K-H-U-M-R-Y. Which sounds very familiar to me because it's on all those cars that drive across the Seven That's Bridge, right. isn't it? Well, they, <laughs> the word Cymru. Since about 1900, they've dropped the K-H and replaced it with a hard C, but the correct spelling up until 1900 was K-H-U-M-R-Y. That's the ten tribes of Israel. They're on Egyptian things. Now, when Austin Layard... I've got to stop you there. Go on. Because this, this, on. Is, this is good. So, are you saying, then, that the early Brits were in fact the ten tribes of Israel. Yeah, I'm going to prove, it. Gonna prove it. Well, they didn't get lost. They knew where they were. Nobody <laughs> else did. <laughs> <laughs> they were hiding in Wales. That's right. Well, in, in the whole of Western Britain, whole actually, of Western probably Britain. Lancashire, okay. up, Cumbria, up to Strathclyde and so on. The, the Dead Sea Scrolls, you've heard of them? Yes. Most of them are on papyrus, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so on. And, but two of them are on copper, mm -hmm. copper scrolls, right? And these uh, appear to have been rolled up and placed in jars for preservation. Mm -hmm. Well, the only way to unroll them was to cut them into a little, roll it a bit, cut a strip, and then lay all the little curved strips alongside each other. Mm -hmm. Then you could see what, what they were saying. Of course, they then found all the Dead Sea Scrolls on papyrus written in Aramaic, right? Mm -hmm. But the two copper ones aren't. And they're not in a different alphabet. Mm -hmm. And they can't read them. <laughs> Guy Allegro said he could, but he can't. Mm -hmm. Well, the theory by Professor <laughs> Carl MacArthur in the States, mm -hmm. he said, I don't know what they are, but they're Hebrew. See, the, the Hebrews and Judeans weren't speaking Hebrew, they were speaking Aramaic, right. ancient Hebrew. And he said, What must have happened is some scribe somewhere in a remote village was given these immensely expensive copper plates mm -hmm. to, to write on and he was semi-literate and smoking a local patois and so he he put it in that of course all the really clever guys and the educated guys they write on cheap inexpensive papyrus it doesn't make sense you see and uh, if you look at the copper scrolls there are holes there's a plate if you put them all together make a plate right there are holes a few inches down all around and holes on the bottom well, clearly it's been a plate that's been nailed onto a wall. Mm -hmm. 
because there's tear marks mm -hmm. up from each of the holes and so on. Mm -hmm. If you rip that copper plate off a wall, roll it up, put it under your shirt or whatever, you've saved it maybe from the Jerusalem temple because it's known that Solomon put plates of gold on the temple walls. Yes. Pharaoh Shishak, Shishak, about 935, took them away. His son Rehoboam couldn't afford gold plates, okay. so he put up. Yeah. No, um, so what we do, we trace the alphabet from yes. there to where they were deported, the 10 tribes were deported. The 10 tribes of Israel are taken away from uh, Jerusalem, right? Solomon's temple's there. Yes. King Ahaziah of Judea, two tribes, he's had a successful battle with the Edomites and he's going to attack 10 tribe Israel. And he's warned, there's a famous verse in the Bible about a passing bullock st stepping on a, a thistle. He's the thistle, you see. Don't do it. Well, he got hammered. His army is destroyed. He's tied behind the chariot of Jehosh, the Israelite king, goes to Jerusalem, pulls down 200 yards of the wall, and Jehoash then takes everything from the palace, and he takes everything from the temple. Oh, including the scrolls, then? Including the ark. Oh, the ark. Aha, uh because -huh. oh. you've got to realize it's in Kings and Chronicles in the Bible, and it's in Flavius Josephus. Oh, wasn't there a family that was... A Correct. Looking after the ark for right. generations. The family of Obed Edom. He took them as well. There'd be no point in taking the family of Obed Edom if he didn't take the ark. So we said, hang on, the ark's gone. So the ark left the temple. It's gone north to Samaria in 790 BC. We know. And you found all the evidence for this, presumably? Yeah. Well, what we did, we tried trying to translate the Etruscan stuff. No. They went north to Samaria. 690, 687, Sennacherib, the Assyrian emperor, is murdered by two of his sons. The heir, the older son, has a civil war with them. The ten tribes take off and they cross the Euphrates, going west through Turkey. Right. Second book of Esdras, chapter 14, right? Okay? Mm -hmm. They are going through Turkey and the Greeks pick up on them and they call these Cymri the Kimaroi. Kimaroi Cymri, right? The Welsh again. They get, well... The Brits. <laughs> the Brits. Yeah, I'm a Brit. You know, we're all Brits. Come on. They get to the Dardanelles. Half the people stay there, and the other half go to Italy. The Dardanelles are in Turkey, aren't they? Yes, on the end of Turkey, with the little gap we've got in the Black Sea. On the Bosphorus. The Bosphorus. Yeah. Where the great city is. Yeah. And of course, that named after Constantine. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Constantinople. So anyway, by looking at the Etrus the Etruscan writings, we found we could read them. To uh, Amelia, the Ten Tribes of Israel. Then they went through Asia Minor, and then half of them went to Etruria, Italy, half went to the Isle of Lemnus, and then to the UK. It's all recorded. Yes. See, in one, one stele of Sennacherib, it says in one of his deportations, he removed 200,120 people. So these are not small groups. That's a huge yeah, they, diaspora. Well, isn't they, it? they went through Asia Minor. The Greeks call them the Kimaroi, the Cymri, you see? Yes. And uh, they were like a tidal wave. Nothing could stop them. Half go to Italy, half stay there. Not like locusts, in a sense. Oh, right. Take some stop. So mm -hmm. the other half stay there, and then they come to Britain in 500. Now, we're still translating. We've moved from Italy. We're in the Aegean now. On the island of Lemnos, a stele was found in 18, 1876, and it's plastered with cauldron writing. And there's a guy holding a spear, a big guy with a spear. And it tells how the people have gathered there, and they're under their On the children. island of Lemnos? Yeah. Well, in the, the British records, they say the people gathered on the Isle of Ligotia, which is Lemnos. Is but surely it? that's further east than Italy. No, it's south of it. In, yes, we've moved. We're going back in time. We're oh, going okay. back. There They've now got the dad nails. Get them on. Okay. They, they gather. In the records, it says, oh, they gathered their fleet at this island. And here's this stele, and it tells how they've been directed by the god, and they're going to sail together to a great green island out in the Western Ocean. That's what it says. So they sailed out of the Straits of Gibraltar through there and... <coughs> to the UK. To the UK. No, they picked up three or four other groups on, en route. One with Corinna, who goes to Cornwall, and uh, so on. 
So here is a story matching the British record of a gathering on an island for sale to the UK. And it's, it's the secret is this language and alphabet, perfectly preserved. The alphabet appears all along the route. Everything depends on that. And there are inscriptions and stating where the ark was at certain times. Right. And it's obviously in the UK. We moved from Britain yeah. to Italy. Okay. And we're on our way to Turkey. We're right. going back in time and distance. There is a famous bronze tablet. Now, you've got to realize bronze is extremely valuable. But there are three sections to it. And the first one says how the people are in a place where there's great pestilence and storms and they're unhappy. And they are taken and led away from this and they follow a little cabinet riding in a cart. So this is the ark? Uh, I think so. And yes. they come to a place where they are content and happy and that's where they live. The second section says they're happy where they are but they're taken away forcibly, right? to a place where they are unhappy, and to get there, they follow a little cabinet that rides in a cart. And the third story is that they again take off, they take off and they go and follow the little cabinet. Because the of the cart. pestilence. And you No, know, the pestilence is the first one. Yeah. The second one, they're forcibly taken away. Okay. And the third one, they're unhappy where they are, so they take off and they go. And half of them go to Etruria. That's in Herodotus. Half of a nation goes to Italy, to Etruria. The other half stayed there for about 500. And then they come to the UK. Now we knew if that little box that rides in a cart is the ark taken from Jerusalem, not south by little baby Menelik in his carry cart to Ethiopia, it was, went north. Right? And if it went north and it went to Dardanelles, it either went to Italy, Etruria, or it came to the UK. We have established a firm trail, and a trail of the people, which matches the history. With evidence. With evidence. If, we, if the alphabet's right, the translation's right, uh, our histories say they gathered on an island of the Gautier. Lemnos. Uses, uh, Lemnos. And it all seems to work together and fit very, very well. Uh, so where do they land in the UK? Uh, well, uh, certainly one group landed in Cornwall. Another group appear to have landed in South Wales in the Aberavon area. Um, there's a famous story of uh, one of the local kings uh, opposes them. And there. there's certain, I think, that one group would have landed in Totnes in, in Cornwall, Devon area. Devon, yeah. I would Thomas. think so, yeah. That's very well sort of, I mean, it's so solidly thought on there, I, would, I wouldn't doubt it. But uh, another major group would have come up the seven to South Wales, that's fairly obvious. Right, Cardiff and the valleys up there on there always had a legend, and the legend is, was known to me when I was a young kid, in the 30s now. Every said about it, it was just a local story. There's a great big box somewhere, a wooden box, and inside this wooden box is a great treasure. And the box is guarded by what they, in Welsh, to Kig Van Goa, which means flesh-eating crows, ravens. A cherubim of all time wasn't a, ni wasn't a nice little angel. He was a fearsome dragon beast with a wings, you see. So there are 13 ancient tales in Wales, and they're called the Mabinogi. The Mabinogi? No, they've restyled them the Mabinogion, which means children's tales, which has shielded them from the church, I think. But the Mabinogi seems to mean origins. So we realized that these were genuine tales saying things about storms and, and, and comets, hit, comets coming into our solar system, Venus going out of orbit, which is matching the ancient observations of Babylonian and other uh, observatories. They say, oh, these guys didn't know what they were doing because Venus didn't do that. It did. Okay. So we then had a, a new couple of other stories which really are how to read the stories. You follow me? That's even a little, it's all wound up with names, but they're, they're really talking about planets and so on. But the last three are important, and the last three are Perida, son of Evrod. Perida is steel shirt. He's the planet Jupiter. There's Geraint and Enid. Geraint is Mars, strength. And the other one is Owen, and Owen is Orion. When you realize they're solar stories, you can realize that we've got constellations in the heavens and the planets move through the constellations because they're orbiting the sun. 
all over South Wales, uh, Glamorgan, Gwent, there are huge mounds, mainly on hilltops. Huge earth mounds, I mean really big earth mounds, size of this room. Some are smaller. And my colleague said to me one day, he said, uh, Alex, what's that one up there, you know? And I said, he, he said, a, a blood yet. I said, a blood yet. Oh, I said, that's a ferocious warrior. And sometimes a penny drops, doesn't it, you know? We'd already learned, ignore the Greeks, ignore the Romans. You want to find something out, ancient Arab, ancient Hebrew, ancient Egyptian names. The ancient Arabs, Hebrews, and Egyptians called the star constellation Hercules a ferocious warrior. And a penny was dropping, and oh boy, because over to the other direction is Tumbalu, the he-goat, Capricorn. And over the other way, we had a very great boat ship on the top of the hill, and that was spot on for the great constellation of Argo. Now, if you've got two or three stars, you can triangulate and find a pole star. Am I right? So we did, and it's a, it's a, it's a standing stone. And from there, we found all these big mounds, they're all named and located for stars, the major stars in the heavens. So you've got a star map on the ground. They go on about the Nazca drawings, don't they, in Peru. We've got something better 